that's okay. I, I'd like to remind you of last summer's story of a drought in Russia. Associated wildfires, whoop, over there. 30% uh, of Russia's wheat harvest goes up in smoke, and the Kremlin responds by banning wheat exports. This causes great consternation in countries that typically rely on Russian grain. Countries like Tunisia, Egypt. And this event last summer, an environmental event, a meteorological event, represents the latest blow save me? I don't use Macs. Did it enter? Okay. Excellent. I'm going to put this thing down and use this thing here. This represents then the latest blow in the international food system. A blow that we can see graphically by looking at the UN's food price index, which is an amalgamation of 54 commodities gathered from markets around the world that gives us a snapshot about how much food costs. Going back from 1990, I think the data speaks for itself. Pretty flat, stable prices up until about the year 2005. And then since 2005, these two sudden and quite dramatic price spikes. Now, these two price spikes, many people think, including the World Bank, represent not just one-off events, but a gradual or even an abrupt restructuring of the world's food system to a higher cost, more expensive food system. And the causes of this are twofold. A number of factors are driving demand for food up, population growth, economic development. At the same time, as pr a number of factors are driving the supply of food down, soil erosion and climate change. And together, many people are concerned that this represents a perfect storm of problems and that by the year 2030, according to no one less than the UK government's chief scientific advisor, John Beddington, we may be facing public unrest and international conflict. And indeed, events from Egypt and Tunisia in the last couple weeks make this issue all the more relevant and immediate. Now, I agree with John Beddington and almost all of the speakers tonight that over the next 20 years, we do indeed face some grave, serious challenges. But I think, I think there's a, coin, a point of optimism we can take here. We as a species have 10,000 years of experience producing food and getting it into cities. And out of that historic record, generally speaking, we do quite well. The historic record is a story of optimism. However, the historic record also cautions us not to be too optimistic, not to take human ingenuity for granted, because there are cases where history shows that this perfect storm of problems deeply unhinges society. My favorite example, and one that Andrew and I explore in our book, Empires of Food, is the rise and fall of medieval Europe, pictured here in the form of Chartres Cathedral, sort of the towering glory of Gothic architecture. Surprisingly, or maybe counterintuitively, we actually have a fair bit of data with which to understand the rise and ultimately the fall of medieval Europe. And this is a population graph here going from just after the Romans sort of declined up to the year 1300 or 1400. And what you'll see is between around the year 900 and around the year 1300, the population of Europe roughly quadruples. Not only is this a growing society, this is a society that's very affluent. And this is the high Middle Ages, a period of time when France alone built 80 cathedrals, 500 abbeys, and 10,000 parish churches. What's interesting for the purposes of tonight's discussion, though, is what happens next. Because by the year 1400, about 40% of Europe had died. Now, what's interesting about this story to me is I don't think if you were a minor noble born around the year 1290, you would have had any way of knowing what was going to happen. That in two generations' time, 40% of your descendants or your neighbor's descendants would be dead. You would have had no way of knowing this was coming except or unless you were watching out for one key indicator, the price of wheat. Because starting in around the year 1200, the price of wheat starts going up. And it goes up for a very familiar set of reasons. A series of factors drive the demand of food, food up. Population growth, urbanization, economic development. At the same time as a series of factors drive the supply of food down. Soil degradation, climate change. And this means that the peasants are pushed to the margins of society. The weak and the powerless are, lose their buffers and their ability to adapt. So in June of 1315, when a bad rain hits the ripening wheat stalks, the peasants can't adapt to the failure of the crop. And this triggers a famine that kills about 20% of Europe. And that triggers a generation of lawlessness, disorder, and economic crisis, which creates an ideal, impoverished, highly mobile population, roving the landscape in search of food and sustenance, which is a perfect breeding ground for disease. So when the Black Death, the bubonic plague, enters Sicily in 1347, it provide, finds an ideal conduit to spread like wildfire. 
a further 30 to 40 percent of your parishes. I don't think in 1290 anybody had any way of knowing that this was going to happen unless they were watching the price of food. Now, I think we can take a step back from examples like this one, and indeed in our book we review quite a few examples, to try to discern some broad mistakes that history says repeat again and again and again in the lead-up to one of these perfect storms. And the first one has to do with the landscape, and Andrew and I call this the vulnerable landscape trap. And it's pictured here in this landscape painting that dates from about the time that Europe started going through the turmoil. And the first thing I'd have you look at is the background, the hills in the distance. And what you'll note is that the landscape has been cultivated up to the very tops of the hills. Now, an economist might look at this landscape and see that this is a marginal agricultural commodity, that it, a resource that is being well used and generating benefit. But an ecologist would look at this and say, as soon as you cut your trees down, guys, you're going to expose your topsoil to wind and rain. And you may have productivity for a number of de years or even a number of decades, but as soon as a bad rain hits, your soil is going to erode and your agricultural system will not recover. This is an accident waiting to happen. Similarly, look at the valley bottom, the monocultural of wheat, an ideal sort of landscape that is highly efficient but vulnerable to pests, wildfires, and other sort of disturbances. The second mistake history tells us are quite common in the lead up to a perfect storm is the fact that these societies create permanent classes of poor and economically marginalized people. In the Middle Ages, this is a period of time of Robin Hood where the popular folklore of the time has the hero of the story as the outlaw. And the church and state, those rich, powerful institutions that should be providing a helping hand to those most in need, well, they're the villains of the story. And if you don't like Robin Hood, Beckett and Reed's risk, asset markets, and inequality evidence from medieval England provides roughly the same story as good old Robin. The third mistake that history says are often associated with the lead up to a perfect storm is what we'd like to call the good weather trap. And generally speaking, it's quite possible to ignore the fact you've got a vulnerable landscape or an economically disenfranchised population while the sun and the rain cooperate. Because while the weather's good, even vulnerable landscapes will remain productive and even economically marginalized people will remain surviving. And indeed, medieval Europe enjoyed pretty good weather. What we've got here is a temperature reconstruction going back about a thousand years. The dotted line in the middle of the graph up there represents the average temperature in Europe over the last thousand years, and the blue line indicates a decadal average. The paleoclimatologists that do this sort of scientific work are pretty sure that the growing season in Europe was long, the average temperature was in the mid-twenties, or ideal for wheat and corn, and it was pretty settled weather patterns, pretty stable weather patterns. However, the good times never last, and indeed around the time when Europe declined, the temperature dropped, the growing season shrunk, and weather patterns became less settled. There's a fair bit of evidence from a number of bodies of literature that draw the same relationship. What we've got in this graph is a temperature reconstruction for Europe going back 5,000 years to, to 3,000 BCE. And the point the author of this article is making is that the Minoans, the Romans, and the medieval period all enjoyed above average temperatures, indicated by that blue line that runs through the middle, and all declined when the temperature moved out of the range that was acceptable or highly productive for wheat and cereal crops. Of course, I think we've roughly made these same three mistakes today. We, too, have created a highly vulnerable landscape. What we've got here is a satellite image from an area of the Amazon forest from 1975. By 1992, agriculture had made major incursions across the landscape, and to a lar an alarming degree, we have replaced the world's forests with monocultures of wheat and other cereal crops. Indeed, scientists estimate that 20 crops provide 90% of the world's food, with wheat, maize, rice, rice, and soy dominating. This sort of agricultural development has caused 75 billion tons of topsoil to wash into the soil each year, and globally the forest area has been reduced by about 40% in the last two centuries. We too have created a permanent class of poor and economically marginalized people. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN estimate that globally there were 925 million people undernourished in the planet last year. This is up from 848 million between 20, 2005 and 2007. And it's worth reflecting both on President Sumer Lee's comment that this represents an astounding proportion of the world's population who missed out, have missed out from the benefits of modernity, and that we're losing the battle. This is getting worse. And finally, we too have enjoyed an unseasonably good stretch of weather. Indeed, between the Dust Bowl in the 1930s, that was referred to by Ben in his slides, and the Sahelian droughts of the 1990s, 
the world's main wheat producing and grain producing areas didn't suffer any truly bad climactic shocks. Here's that temperature reconstruction going back 5,000 years I showed you a minute ago. And here's the data for the 20th century. The point these authors are making, the 20th century enjoyed many of the same conditions as the Romans, the Medievals, and the Minoans. Some of the high watermarks of human society. Now these historic societies declined during a cooling, and we expect the temperature to keep rising, but let's face it, anything outside of a growing season temperature of the mid-20s is unproductive for our cereal crop. The data becomes even more alarming when we look at rainfall reconstructions. What we have in this graph here is a, temperature, is a rainfall reconstruction for the Great Plains of the USA, one of the world's most important grain-producing regions, going back to 2,000 years on the left to roughly the present on the right. And again, that zero line that runs right down the middle of this graph represents the long-term average precipitation for this region. And what it have you note are the red areas, like the ones highlighted here. 300 years of drought, followed by 300 years of above-average precipitation. Now let's look specifically at the data since, 19, uh, since 1700 and focus our attention on what's happened in, since 1975. We've had above-average rainfall for this region. So both from a temperature perspective and a rainfall perspective, the paleoclimatologists are pretty certain we've enjoyed pretty good weather, but we don't expect the good weather to last. And history tells us that when the good weather stops, we start having to pay the price for having a vulnerable landscape and an economically marginalized population. So as I wrap up, what's the solution to this? Well, remember when I started my comments a few minutes ago, I said that the overwhelming lesson of history was actually one of optimism, where history tells us that the good times by far outnumber the collapses. And generally speaking, human ingenuity weathers and adapts to and ingeniously comes up with technological solutions to prevent the perfect storm. So in the spirit of trying to foster adaptive capacity, here's a four-pronged solution. First of all, we need a radically new approach to how we do scientific research to make Africa more productive and more resilient. Illustrated here by this graph that goes back to 1960, my last graph, I promise, shows what farmers around the world can expect from their fields. In the European Union, the farmer in 1960 could get between two and 3,000 kilograms of grain per hectare. By the 2005, they're getting between six and 7,000 kilograms per hectare. Canada, the US, Australia, very similar kind of Grit data. How very different the situation is in sub-Saharan Africa, where the benefits of modern technology that have allowed for the growth in the rich part of the world have entirely been missed. This to me says that we cannot do scientific research, agricultural research, in the same way as we've done for the last 50 years. What we need to do is far humbler, far less sexy, far less profitable. Work in partnership with, at the small scale with African farmers to identify appropriate technologies cost-effective technologies to close this awful yield gap. Prong two, we need a new approach to international trade that acknowledges both the importance of promoting regional specialization and ecological diversity. Now at first blush, ecological specialization, regional specialization and ecological diversity are pulling in different directions. But let me explain. Every productive part of the planet is slightly different in terms of its soils, its topography, and its climate. And those differences make some regions especially good at producing certain crops. We, in a world with 9 billion people, cannot afford to use our land inefficiently. We need to capitalize on those regional efficiencies and specialize on them. So the area that produces wheat effici efficiently should produce wheat, and the area that does pasture efficiently should do pasture. However, this does not mean genetic monocultures. This, illustration, this point is illustrated nicely by this painting called The Wisconsin Landscape, painted by the American landscape artist John Stuart Curry in the 1930s. And this is a, uh, a dairy-producing landscape. Wisconsin, because of its topography, its soils, and its climate, has a unique ability to produce high-quality dairy. It's regionally specialized in dairy, but it's still very diverse. It's got a mixture of activities. It's a landscape mosaic, all working together. The third prong is that we need to maintain a local food system alongside the global one. As the global food system comes under increasing strain, like most people think it's going to continue to do over the next decade, what we're going to be very grateful for is to keep local productive capacity. And the best way I could think to illustrate this is with a map of Toronto Greenbelt, Toronto's Greenbelt legislation. Now, this is an expensive piece of public policy. 
It's a controversial piece of public policy, and in some regards, some people argue, it was executed in a ham-fisted way. Nevertheless, this represents a significant investment by society in maintaining Ontario's local food system. Keep the farms and the farmers intact. Another aspect of the local food system that has to be maintained is we should store food as a buffer against the crisis. Now, storing food at a household level all the way through to a national level was quite commonplace in previous generations and in previous societies. In our pursuit of having an economically efficient food system, we have embraced the just enough, just in time mentality, and generally speaking, the world does not store very much food right now. We need to re-engage with this idea of storing food at the household level, at the community level, and all the way through up to the national level to buffer ourselves against crises. And finally, as I'm going to wrap up, we need to develop a food culture. The new approach to science, the new paradigm for trade, the political and economic investment required to maintain a local food system, none of this will be possible unless the consumers of this world, you and me, develop a food culture. To illustrate this, I thought I'd put up the logo of the slow food movement. About 15 years ago, a group of Italian music event organizers grew horrified at the sight of McDonald's selling Big Macs across the piazza from where Michelangelo carved David. They decided, damn it, the world needs an alternative. Slow food as a counterpoint to fast food. It's a big movement now. Tens of thousands of members. Slow food reminds us of two key points that I think need to be remembered. First of all, it reminds us that eating is a political act. Every time we choose one commodity over another, one supermarket over a farmer's market, we are voting for a system. In the modern age, in the modern day, in modern day Canada, we have generally forgotten that lesson. The second lesson that slow food gives us is an important one as well. Eating's fun. It's tasty. It's good fun. So the transition towards a high cost food system need not be awful. We can do a huge amount of community building around the dining room table. So this need not be a scary transition. So to put it all together, more of our effort as a society in terms of our time, our resources, and our policy will be directed towards producing and storing food over the 21st century. In my opinion, this is inevitable, and the low prices that we've enjoyed in the late 20th century will be seen historically as quite anomalous. History warns us that these sort of transitions can be quite horrific and deeply undermine the quality of life of millions of people for many years. However, the slow food movement suggests these transitions don't need to be horrific. They can actually be quite pleasant. Thank you very much.